tales for dark nights. I don't work late anymore. That's what the guys told me the first day I joined the company as a cubicle rat, that we don't work late here. The office could be any one of a million around the world, partitions about five feet high, too high for a person to be distracted by looking or talking to cubicle neighbors, unless he was standing up. The air swirls with a miasma of electronics, printer toner, stale coffee, and air freshener. A soft whispering of muttered curse words, the scratchy sounds of music leaking out of cheap headphones, and the drag of smart shoes across the dull gray carpet. Rows upon rows of cubicles, a graveyard of college dreams. I'm in the last row of cubicles before the drywall, all the way in from the doors to the elevator, the fire escape, the windows, and any form of natural light. The only consolation was that there was a good eight feet of walking room behind me, enough space for copiers and the occasional conversation with my fellow cubicle rats. By my second week at the office, the learning curve was already getting to me. First thing, on Friday morning, I had to turn in a report, and it was already Thursday evening. I hadn't even finished half of the required number crunching. I was in full work mode, headphones on, music blasting. It was past one in the morning when I received the first pop-up on my computer. We watch. It had been sent from Brad's desk. No working late, I thought. Yeah, right. I guess they didn't want anyone pulling ahead of the Rat Pack. Stop messing with me, I replied. I gotta rush this. By one thirty, it was time to start loading up on caffeine. I stopped by Brad's desk on my way out. No one was there. I figured that Brad had left sometime during the past half an hour. I brewed myself an extra strong cup of coffee at the pantry and looked out of the window at the deserted lot. I saw one solitary car, mine, and the wobbling shine of a flashlight as the building's only security guard made his rounds. It was just going to be me and the spreadsheets for the rest of the night. I headed back to my desk. Another message from Brad awaited me. Play with us. There was no way Brad could have been in a building. The car park was empty. Stop messing with me, I messaged him angrily. I'm in the building and I need to finish up my report. I dropped my phone onto the desk. I stopped over to Brad's desk. I was certain that I would be able to identify some VPN trickery that was enabling him to pull off his stunt through the corporate firewall. I scanned through the running programs, but couldn't find anything. Puzzled, I took off my headphones, and for the first time that night, I froze. The ventilation sounded strange. Instead of the usual low rumble in the background, it came in intermittent whooshing pulses. The pauses gave me the eerie feeling that the entire building was breathing. I was seriously considering giving up on the report and getting out of the building when something made the decision for me. Messages start to appear on Brad's computer. Too many, too fast, to open all at once. Stay with us. The messages were being sent simultaneously from all the computers on the floor. I looked into the next cubicle and found the screen illuminated by the same flood of messages. Elaborate joke or not, I was thoroughly freaked out. Okay, you guys win! I yelled with feigned bravado across the empty office. I raced back to my cubicle and was confronted by the sight of my own terrified face on my computer screen. Someone had switched my webcam on. Someone, or something, was in the room with me. Turning on their webcam required that a physical switch be flicked. As I watched, another message popped up on my screen. Watch! The lights went out. Every single ceiling light and every other computer screen. By that point, I was already half-crazed with fear and let out a yelp. 
In reality, the blackout may have only lasted a few seconds, but at the time, it felt like hours. The entire room was dark, with the exception of the faint glow from my monitor. Since my cubicle faced the wall, there was nothing but pitch black behind my face on the screen. Ready to leave, I scooped up my car keys. That's when I saw them. Two bright points above my left shoulder in the darkness, outside my cubicle. I shivered. Goosebumps rising on my arms, mesmerized by the two points. As I watched, one of the points disappeared for a second, then reappeared. That's when I realized what they were. Eyes. A wink. At that moment, I did the only intelligent thing I did the entire night. Instead of turning around, I clambered up on my desk, crushing the keyboard along the way, and went over the cubicle wall. I tumbled into the next cubicle and scooted backwards. I strained my ears to listen for the sound of breathing or footsteps, anything that could have told me which direction the person, or thing, was coming from. Nothing. I didn't hear a thing, but I felt it. The only illumination came from the emergency lighting near the fire escape in the elevator. I could feel the darkness growing deeper down the aisle. I realized then that I had never known true fear, the absolute terror when your body seizes up and your muscles refuse to obey you. In my life, my breath came in short rasps. Iron bands tightened around my lungs. I tried to get up, shift backwards, or move at all, but I was shaking like a leaf. My body was soaked with sweat while my blood turned to ice in my veins. Brad saved my life that night. The banal tune announcing an incoming message broke the silence, ringing clearly throughout the vacant office. The dark paused, confused for a second, and the spell was broken. I was on my feet and down the fire escape in seconds. The next day I'd learned that the message that saved me was a simple, Get out now! I tore down the stairwell. I was already booking it across the library to the main entrance when I heard the unmistakable chimes of the elevator descending from the fifth floor. I burst out of the building and sprinted across the parking lot. As I burned rubber, I took one last look through the lobby at the elevator. It was totally dark inside, not just as if the lights were out. It was as though the light from the foyer itself was being repelled by whatever was in the lift. That was the last time I stayed late for work. Following the ordeal, I took two days off. Upon my return, I found a message left for me at my computer. We're still watching. My boss was surprisingly understanding about my missing the deadline. I told him that I tried to stay up late to finish it up but fell sick instead. There was a flash of understanding in his eyes. He gave me another two days to finish. My co-workers and I never spoke of the incident specifically, though Brad and some of the others looked at me differently after that night. Any food with meat in it spoils usually fast at the office, Brad told me later on what he felt was a related note. It's all right on the first day, but if it's left overnight, it'll spoil immediately, like it's been out in the sun for a week. Brad told me that his first experience with this had been the year he'd been tasked with carving a turkey for an annual holiday lunch. That year, only half the turkey had been eaten, so he stored the leftovers in a container in the fridge. When everyone returned to the office Monday... The pantry reeked of death. It turned out that, although it had been refrigerated over the weekend, the entire tub had rotted into a brownish-blackish goop. Brad ruled out a power outage when he realized that the gallon of milk beside the turkey hadn't spoiled. After a round of beers, I convinced Brad to share some other details with me, and he confided in me something that, to this day, he has never mentioned to the rest of the office— that within the rotten mess he'd found what was left of the turkey bones scored from top to bottom with teeth marks, as if something had been gnawing on them. Two months after the incident, I was all but certain I wasn't the only one in the office who had experienced something odd during the overnights. 
Yet there seemed to be a wall of vow of silence in place, discouraging discussion of the strange occurrences. No one wanted to talk about anything that happened after hours. The guards weren't much help either. One of them told me that they had given up patrolling the building at night because the lights kept switching off and the vents were breathing. The night shift guards spent as much time patrolling the outside of the building as possible and only ventured into the lobby for short breaks. One of the guards I spoke to was even more practical. Since no one ever worked late or came back to retrieve anything, he spent most of his night shift in plain clothes at a nearby 24-hour cafe. Nobody wants to end up like Jason. Poor kid went loco and slid his wrist in the office. The name sounded familiar. Something clicked. Jason was the name of one of the guys who used to sit at my table. No one told me anything about him, but his name and voice were indelibly etched in my memory for the most trivial of reasons. At the time of my hire, I didn't know how to work the voicemail on my office line. I spent three weeks listening to Jason introducing himself every single time I checked my voicemail. Coincidentally, it was Brad who helped me troubleshoot. Brad quickly became my closest friend in the office. He was a large man, well over six feet tall, and wrestled in high school. If you looked closely, you could just make out the shape of a star college athlete beneath the 18 years of burgers, takeout, and pizzas. A great sense of humor rounded out the image of an all-round good guy. Since Brad had told me about the Christmas incident, it stood to reason that he could tell me about Jason as well. The day before was payday, so early that evening, Brad and I hit a series of bars. He was doing most of the drinking. At the third bar, I broached the topic of Jason. Jason was a smart kid, you know, Brad said. Just out of college, still living college hours, even though he'd touched down in corporate America. His entire life was jet-lagged. He'd come in at 10 a.m. and work till midnight. Brad evidently caught my intake of breath when he mentioned Jason's working hours. He continued, Jason got the messages, too. At some point or another, all of us have. Late at night, mostly. Sometimes, when everybody's stepped out for lunch and you're the only one in the office, same kind of message you told me about. Jason was no exception. Told me about it after his first day of work. He told me he stopped the messages by pulling the network cable out. Like I said, smart kid. A few nights of that, and he started to act strange. He started hanging around quiet spots around the office, talking to himself. We found him on the roof once and later in the stationary room. The boss was concerned. Every time Jason handed in work after pulling an all-nighter, extra pages were attached, with row after row of the same thing written over and over. They watch me. Boss told him on Thursday that Friday would be his last day and not to come back on Monday. It happened on Friday. It was 2 p.m. The public address system went off. At first, we thought it was the annual fire drill or something. Then we heard him crying. He cleared his throat and said, They watched me. He went silent for a second. Then there was a small metallic snap and more silence. Then he took a big, shuddering breath, then moaned and cried some more. Then he repeated the same three words again. They watch me. All of us were at our desks, jaws hanging open. Things went on like that for five straight minutes. Some of the women started crying. At that point, the boss hauled me up. He said he needed a couple of big guys to bust down the door to the security room told me that Jason snuck in when the guard stepped out for lunch and locked himself in there. So we were outside the security room. At the time, Jason was still on the PA system. His voice was weaker, and he was coughing and slurring a lot more by then. Since I was the biggest, I called dibs on throwing myself at the door. The door busted open on my third try. By that time, there was nothing but a gurgling sound coming over the speaker's. The room was pitch dark. I was in there for a good thirty seconds with Jason before someone turned on the light. Then the dark. Brad paused, 
clearly troubled by the memory. He took a long draft of beer. They told you that he slit his wrist, didn't they? I nodded, numbly. It's with the boss, and I told everyone else. Only two of us saw him before the ambulance arrived, you see. He didn't slit his wrist. He'd gotten a couple of those big box-cutter knives we got down in stationery. He'd been snapping off the little sections of the blade and swallowing them while he spoke on the PA. There was blood everywhere. He didn't say another word until he died of blood loss in the ER. He must have swallowed a dozen shards. His story complete, Brad turned back to the beers with a vengeance. He downed another two before he unsteadily rose to his feet. I'd swapped out for Coke after the second beer. On the drive home, Brad snored away in the passenger seat, but there was one more detail I had to know. I prodded him with my elbow. You said something about the dark in the room, I coaxed. We weren't alone, me and Jason. Something else was in there with us. Brad's voice sounded dreamy, far away. I don't even think it was fully conscious. Nobody came in after me because no light would get into the room. Only the boss had the sense to stick his hand into the room to flip the light switch. When the lights came on, the dark, the shadows, moved away from it, flowing like water, like it was alive. We spent the rest of the ride in silence. I left him in the care of Daisy, his long-suffering partner. She gave me a tired smile as she helped them into their house. On my way back home, I received the first of many phone calls. The number nearly made me swerve off the road. It was an office line. Jason's office line. I rejected the call. Five minutes later, I got a second call. I rejected it again. By the time I'd reached my house, I rejected no less than seven calls from the office. It was already past midnight. I took the battery out of my mobile and left the phone next to my house keys. I took a shower and nearly drifted off to sleep when my home phone started to ring. I was exhausted, and by the time I turned on the bedside lamp, I heard the tail end of the message on my answering machine. Please leave your message after the beep. I only had time to think, oh God, no, before I heard the sobbing followed by Jason's voice, the voice that I remembered from work. They watch you. Sob, snap, sigh, over and over again. My first rational thought was that someone had recorded Jason's last words, and was playing the recording over the phone to me. But as I listened to the voice from where I stood in my bedroom, I understood that it couldn't have been a recording. I stared through the dimly lit doorway for an eternity, before I realized just how dark it truly was in the hallway, so abysmal that even the red LED on the answering machine was shrouded. No illumination, not the street lights nor the light from any of the nearby windows, nor the living room, spilled into the hallway from where I stood. I was not alone. From that moment, instinct took over, and just as the clock struck 2 a.m., I barricaded myself in my bedroom. I shoved my writing desk in front of my door, shut the curtains, and locked the windows. I blasted my music at full volume to drown out the maddening monologue issuing from just beyond my door. By the time I summoned enough courage to crack open my bedroom door, it was well past 11 a.m. A cursory glance into the living room revealed nothing but the morning light streaming through the window and the message light on my answering machine, winking like a malevolent eye. I took the entire machine down to the corner of the street and dumped it in a trash can. Then I sent an email to the boss saying I would be out the next two days. When I finally got back to work, the first thing I noticed was how tired Brad looked. 
My experience with my answering machine was deeply unsettling, but it was nothing compared to what Brad must have gone through. His eyes were bloodshot and ringed with dark circles. The sour smell of sweat clung to him. He confided that he'd received prank calls throughout the night, but that he never once managed to pick up the phone in time. He also said work was piling up, so he'd been trying his best to get a couple of reports done before the weekend. As the week wore on, Brad grew more distant and reclusive. He began to avoid conversation with everyone, including me. He took to staying at the office even later than I did. Every day, when I clocked out without fail, I saw his car sitting there in the lot. Any attempts to talk sense into him were met with silence. I thought that the upcoming weekend would be a good excuse to conspire with Daisy to lift the spirits, perhaps by taking him out for a nice meal or a drink somewhere. Saturday morning was when things started going wrong. I woke up to find a text message from Brad on my phone, time-stamped at 2 a.m. They watched me. I felt numb with shock. I desperately tried to recall Jason's story. Had Brad exhibited any signs other than being tired and withdrawn? I knew I had to do something. I called Brad's mobile. When I got no response, I tried Daisy, but she wasn't much help either. Brad hadn't come home the night before, and she was nearly senseless with worry. He'd been working too hard, she said, and he'd kept getting calls from the office late at night. My vision swam, and I nearly dropped my phone when I heard that. Where are you? I texted Brad, hoping that he would answer. I've always been here. Still here, waiting. Are you safe? Are you okay? I responded. Talk too much. Fixed it. Are you in the office? Can you come out and meet me? I replied, unsure what to make of his last answer. Not leaving. Still busy. Come and see. Something wasn't right. I tasted bile at the back of my throat and choked back the fear as the memory of Jason's voice on my answering machine rushed back. I knew where Brad was. It was 11 a.m. when I arrived at the office. The sight of Brad's car sitting alone in the car park greeted me. The engine was cold. I found a day shift guard leaning against the side of the building. His name tag proclaimed that he was Jim. I asked if he had seen Brad go into the building. He replied that Brad's car had been there when he'd taken over from the previous guard, and that he, much like all the other guards never wandered around the building alone. He agreed to come up with me to look for Brad. We both paused at the lobby, and after exchanging a telltale look, we opted for the staircase instead. Neither of us wanted to take the elevator. Just as we reached our destination, my phone chimed to alert me that I'd received an incoming message. I didn't check it, electing to push open the door of the stairwell instead. Upon our arrival at the fifth floor, I shouted for Brad, but got no response. I noted that all the lights were off. Sunlight streamed ineffectually through the office windows and failed to dispel the room's shadowy pall. Everything was still. I noticed then how cold it was in the office, as if someone had cranked the air conditioning all the way up. As we walked toward Brad's cubicle, I noticed that the ventilation was pulsating, I once again got the feeling that the building was taking slow, wheezing breaths. A torrent of frigid air accompanied us to Brad's desk. We discovered Brad slumped over at the desk, a trickle of blood from his mouth pooling on its surface. It was already cold to the touch. Jim was industriously efficient, already on the phone with emergency services, giving them our location and a description of the circumstances. I pulled out my phone to look at the last text message I'd received. It was from Brad. Time to play. Brad had clearly been dead for some time. Jim had already sensed the tension, and his fingers tightened instinctively around the can of mace at his belt. My fingers shook as I dialed Brad's number on my phone. The sound of Brad's ringtone cut through the lethargic pulse of the ventilation. 
Both of us jumped, and Jim actually whipped out his can of mace. The tune reverberated across the room, sounding both muffled and amplified, as if it was emanating from a tight space, echoing off bare walls. Jim and I both locked eyes on the inevitable source of the melody. In the darkness, just ten feet away, behind a ventilation grill near the ceiling, was the faint glimmer of an LCD screen casting shadows inside the vent. The look on my face told Jim everything he needed to know. We both broke into a dead sprint for the staircase. We passed as many as four vents in our mad 40-yard dash. I took one last look up at the vent next to the door at the staircase. Brad's ringtone blasted from it, and I saw the same glimmer of light radiating from the grates. The paramedics arrived ten minutes later. Jim stayed on the ground floor while I went up with them. I looked away as the EMTs went about their work. After some time, the lead ambulance technician came over to have a word with me. The police will be here in a bit to look over things, to make sure there's no foul play or anything. Do you have any idea how he died? I asked tentatively. There were no obvious injuries. My guess? Some sort of aneurysm? Blood vessel popped in his head? From the looks of it, he had some kind of seizure, too. It's rare, but not impossible. The man grimaced. Your friend, uh... He bit off half of his tongue. Our guys are still searching for it. Talked too much. Fixed it. Brad's message. Oh, dear God. By the way, the tech said, interrupting my epiphany. Would you guys mind turning on the A.C.? It's a little stuffy in here. I looked him in the eye, the terrible realization dawning on me, and strained to hear the sounds of ventilation over the bustle of the paramedics. The air conditioning was on a timer and has always been disabled on weekends. That's when I marched straight out of the office for the last time. Never to set foot in that building again. I quit. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.